So getting back to the initial lecture for um, essentially the first couple of chapters of Brownson. For this particular presentation, I'm going to use a recording from a lecture that Dr. Clavo Hall gave as a part of this course the last time that she taught it. One of the things you'll note is that the nature of the audio in the recording is such you can tell that she's in a classroom actually giving the lecture and they actually had technical difficulties about halfway through so you'll notice a change in the nature of the audio as you're going through. However, I feel that the content is still accessible, which is why I've decided to use this particular one because I think that Dr. Clavo Hall does an exceptional job of introducing us to the topic as a part of this lecture. Some of the things that we need to address about uh, translational research is that it has not been decided on what the terminology is consisting of. You have people with using translational research that are not just in the medical field. You may have people in the airline industry. You have people in the banking industry. You have people in agriculture. They use translational research as well. And we're finding that not only do you not have the same terminology within fields, you have different terminology between fields and even in different countries. Uh, say Canada may have a slightly def different definition of how it uses translational research than Japan, than Germany. So that's part of the issue with the challenge here. And for us, we're going to use the definition of the CDC, looking at translational research as the systematic uh, study of how the specific sets of activities and design strategies are used to successfully integrate the evidence-based practice uh, interventions to public health uh, interventions that we're using in specific settings. Now here you have translational research. It's look, put together or compiled with dissemination research, which is a study in itself, and implementation research, which is another study in itself, and diffusion research. And we're looking at how it all comes together. So it has a starting point of having a level of complexity. We're looking at a definition for dissemination, a systematic study of how the targeted distribution of information and intervention materials uh, to a specific public health audience can be successfully executed. So that increased spread of knowledge about this evidence-based intervention uh, to the public health intervention is achieved to a greater extent and has a greater impact. Implementation research, systematic study of how the specific activities, design strategies are used to successfully integrate the evidence-based uh, interventions into the specific settings. And notice that we have settings as primary care clinics, we have community centers, we have schools, we have churches. You could have uh, a uh, area receiving, doing uh, translational research that could even be, say for instance, in the MOBEC unit here at Turo. So then we have diffusion research and that's a study of factors necessary for the successful adoption by the stakeholders uh, and the targeted population to see that the intervention results in a widespread, a wider spread use of the successful interventions. Now we're looking at statewide, nationwide, and I'm going to challenge you to say even globally in your mind of what globally might contain. So then you have another uh, couple of uh, terms that I want to introduce, scaling up. So when we have scaling up, we are looking at the environment, which may be sm smaller environment or even a healthcare organization, but you have the innovation, that's the intervention that you're looking at. And when we talk about innovation, we're talking about what is new to the user. And innovation does not have to be a mind-boggling, brand new, unheard of concept. 
And innovation is that which is new to those stakeholders that are going to be using it, okay, or impacted by it. So you have the innovation, then you have the resource team, that's those bringing it to the environment, and then you have the users, could be individuals or organizations. That's the elements of scaling up. In scaling up, you usually have tried the intervention on a smaller scale, and there is more of a discussion of scaling up in your book on Brownson, and you can read more about scaling up on page 25. And when you get there, but I want you to pay attention to what they say about scaling up as far as vertical versus horizontal scaling up. And that's something you want to make note of when you do your reading. So as we go on, another term that we're looking at is de-implementation. So when we talk about de-implementation in dissemination of implementation, this is looking at stopping or abandoning the practices that have not proven to be effective and are even possibly harmful. How many times have you been in the clinical practice and you've asked the question, why are we still doing this? This is hurting the patient. Uh, I'm gonna go back and date myself why are we still using silk tape on 80-year-old women's skin? Yes. It hurts. It, it, you're causing more harm than good. Okay. So what do we do? What evidence can we find that will help us to stop doing these harmful behaviors? Another one, and I don't mean to step on anyone's toes. We're talking just the evidence. Why are we not insisting that all practitioners wash their hands before they come into contact with patients? Not just nurses, all practitioners. So that's de-implementation. And when you have time, look at this choosing wisely uh, link, this site. This site is dedicated to gathering research on areas of healthcare that need to be uh, de-implemented. And some of these areas were implemented based on scientific information, but you will find as investigators that science grows because those things that we once believed in were subsequently proven not to be as effective as we once thought they were. So even though something may have been have started based on evidence, we're talking about the most recent and current available evidence, not the evidence that may have led you to start that practice from the beginning. I just want to pause the recording of Dr. Clavo Hall's lecture for a minute because I wanted to add that when it comes to de-implementation. It is something that I think is worth diving into more. And in all honesty, I would suggest that as you start thinking about your own doctoral research and what you might look at doing, taking a de-implementation project might be something that uh, would be both challenging, but also something that might be quite rewarding within your particular setting. Now let's turn our attention back to Dr. Clavo Hall's lecture. So, then on top of that, you have something called the 17-year odyssey. And we'll see this in a couple of different ways. We start out with a problem, and the problem begins with this is such a problem it's making so many people ill causing such an impact in health we should do something about it we begin by basic research with each of these arrows that you see at the step level look at that as a leak in this pipeline this long thing is the pipe and here's the leak you're losing some of the volume you're losing a little bit when you have to do the peer reviews you lose a little bit when you have to wait for publication. You lose a little bit when you're doing research synthesis. And by the time all of these things have happened, on average, 17 years have passed. And this is all of that you're getting out of the knowledge that you've gained along the way back here 17 years ago. 
situations change, problems change, priorities change, funding changes, and all of that impacts our outcome. Let's look at it from a different perspective. Here is what happens. We say, oh, you need to write more articles. You need to write more research. Well, this is what a research or an academic in research uh, runs into. They get the idea about the problem. I think we need to do something about uh, stopping smoking. So we look at it. We say that we are going to apply for a grant so we can look at a way to get uh, the youth to stop smoking, 14 years and uh, 14 to 16 year olds to stop smoking. So you put in the application, then you get to wait up to 2.3 years before you actually get funding to do the research, which takes almost another three years. Then you have to get the results and analyze the results. You see how it goes on and on. So by the time you get the final product out, all of this waiting, then what has changed since then? How about, I figured a way to stop youth from smoking cigarettes, but now we're on electronic vapors. So my research on stopping you from putting a tobacco stick in your mouth is not as relevant to what life is today. So this is some of what we're losing in the 17-year odyssey. I want to pause Dr. Clavo Hall's lecture again so I can interject with an example. The textbook itself provides us with three examples of instances where we've seen a considerable gap with penicillin, insulin, and smallpox. I know when Dr. Clavo Hall did this course last year, she included this example, which, um, as you can see, is much more considerable in terms of the time frame, as it says there in the orange from the time, you know, in 1601, when Lancaster found what he thought was a potential solution for the problem of, of scurvy within his crew. It took 264 years before it was something that was adopted by uh, British seafarers throughout the age of exploration. And um, while that's 264 years from when Lancaster tested it, if you look at it, the idea for it actually occurred 104 years before that, or 368 years before it actually became widespread practice. Turning to Dr. Clavel Hall's lecture one final time. This is something that you're going to see, translational research, the continuum, and I want to point this out. This is bench research, what's going on in the laboratory. This is where we take what happened in the laboratory, T2, and we're developing our clinical practice guidelines that you use in your clinical practice, in the hospital, in the clinic, the guidelines that come out. This is where your course is today. This is where dissemination research, implementation research, diffusion research is beginning to happen, where we're taking the research that occurred at the bench and beginning to try and get it to the real world, to the public, out to public health, out to larger patient populated areas. This is where we are. And sometimes some of it gets to T4 when we get to those national, state, and global uh, trans, uh, translational research. But this is where our class is at this point. And that concludes the portions of the lecture that I wanted to use from the recordings that Dr. Clavo Hall had done in previous semesters. So that's an introduction to and a bit of an overview of some of the main features that you should take away from the first couple of chapters of uh, Bronson and his co-authors. Um, if you have any questions, please feel free to email me or to use the discussion form that's called Questions and Support. Um, and I'd encourage you to do that as opposed to emailing me, not because I don't want to hear from you. In fact, I'm more than happy to engage with you all through email. But the 
discussion forum is a public forum that's available to everyone within the course and there are eight to ten of you and there's one of me so the chances that one of your colleagues will see your query before I do mathematically speaking is actually quite high and they may know the answer to that question or they may be able to add to my answer by providing specific examples from their professional context which may help not only you but all of the other students in the class that are reading that question and reading those answers it may help them understand the topic a little bit better so by using that public form not only do you benefit from the knowledge and experiences of your colleagues but you also allow your colleagues to benefit from the fact that you had a query about something. So I'd encourage you to use that form as much as possible.